Hi, this is Dr. S.P. Harsa from Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department, I.D. Roorkee. I'm going to deliver my lecture 21 on the course of the strength of material and this course is developed under the National Program on Technological Enhanced Learning. Prior to start this lecture, I just want to refresh the uh, prior discussion as we discussed in the previous lectures that you know when we have a circular shaft or any uh, circular bar is there and whenever you see any twisting moment is applied on that uh, or any uh, torque is applied on that then you know like the shear deformations are there and the circular bar is under the pure state of shear stress. And due to the shear stress, you know, like uh, it is always there starting from the center position and it is uh, going uh, maximum on the circumferences. So, shear stresses are always maximum and the, uh, on the top of the surfaces of a circular bar that we proved. And then you see, you know, like we found that whenever the shear stresses are there, since uh, this load application or we can say the torque application or any twisting moment application is just within the elastic deformation this assumptions we made this assumption we made basically and we also we made that we uh, put the assumption that whatever material which we are using that is purely a homogeneous material so under those conditions we simply apply the hooks law and we found that whatever the series stress is coming due to that the series strains are there and with those things you know like uh, there is a uh, this angle of twist is there and we would like to relate all those uh, coefficients together with the using of the generalized Hooke's law. So, with that we, we formed a basic equation for the torsional part if you remember that T by J equals to tau by R is equals to G theta by L. So, with that you see you know like uh, we found that uh, simply whenever we are discussing about the tau it is absolutely re related with the shear modulus of uh, this uh, inertia and then also we discussed with the, if uh, any shear stresses are increasing with the radius obviously it is going starting from the center and going uh, towards outward direction with the maximum value or also we, we found that actually whatever the shear modulus of uh, rigidity is there always associated with the how much angle angle of twist is there and if you want to you know like uh, measure the whatever the angle twist or we can say the deformation or distortion due to the shear stresses we can simply measure with the uh, using of uh, the shear strain. So, with that you see you know like uh, we uh, uh, after that we uh, you know like discuss that uh, Whenever this kind of uh, shear deformation is there, then how we can uh, you know like correlate with the using of shear modulus of rigidity. So you see, we found that if we have a continuous bar, then this uh, equation is very very well valid. But if we have you know like the this uh, solid circular bar or hollow shaft, then what exactly the comparison is? That means you see, if we are using the same shaft, just one with the same diameter and the length is same. But one is the solid shaft and one is the uh, this hollow shaft or we can say the circular shaft in which there are two diameter then we compared both the thing with the same diameter and with the same material and we found that only the uh, difference was the two diameter and we found that uh, there is you see you know like the shear stress uh, is maximum you know like the 6.6% 6, 6 uh, shear stresses are maximum in, uh, in uh, like hollow shaft as compared to the solid shaft and also we you know like discuss that if we cut the solid shaft exactly from the middle point and if we remove that portion to make the hollow shaft then you see you know like the weight comparison there is a total 25% weight reduction is there but the shear stresses are more 6.6% .6 more. So, meaning is pretty simple that actually if you would like you know like uh, to design a circular shaft based on our uh, weight criteria then always we would like to go irrespective of whatever the series stresses are then we would like to choose the hollow shaft. But if our weight of if our design criteria is absolutely based on that shear stress is there and you see whatever you know like the applications are there and due to these application if shear stresses are dominating in the nature and we want to design the our circular shaft against those uh, uh, shear stresses then probably we, uh, we would like to you know like choose the solid shaft irrespective of whatever the weight criteria is there. So, that means you see you know like we can compare those parts and then we discussed that actually if we have not the uniform bar that means it's not a, a uniform prismatic bar but if we have you know like the stabbed bar means you see two or three different diameters are there then how we can you know like uh, find it out the 
these uh, you know like the torque as well as the, this uh, you know like if the two different torques are there or three different torques are there all together then how we can find out the deformation or we can say the angle of twist and then corresponding you see since we are measuring on the basis of the shear strain so how we can find out the total shear strain and based on that actually how we can uh, you know like set up the relationship so in that we found that instead of because it's a different different uh, areas are there effective areas are there and you see since we have the di uh, different uh, effective area so obviously Obviously, you see the J value will be different based on that T value is different. So, probably you know like we would like to you know like put the summation criteria that for a small small segment take one part, second part, third part and sum up all those parts to get the final value. And then you see in the final version we discussed in the previous lecture that actually instead of the stepped bar if we have a continuous bar but uh, uh, the shape of that bar is in a uh, tapered section that means there is a continuous bar. So, instead of you know like taking the different different segment what we are doing here we are simply taking a small uh, section at uh, some point uh, we can say generally we use the x distance from the left hand side of, uh, of the depth of the dx. So, you see we would like to check that actually what exactly the deformation is there of that particular part okay by taking t by j equals to g theta by l and then put you see just we will calculate the theta x for that particular segment and then instead of putting the summation action what we are going to do we are simply you know like uh, using uh, uh, this integration sign and this since it is a the whatever you see the cross sectional area is there it is you know like uniform all across this particular bar. So, we simply put the 0 to uh, this whatever the length of this area is there uh, the, the area is there and simply we put the integration sign within the dx, dx formation. So, pretty simple that actually if you have this step bar then you pretty you better use the you know like the sigma the sigma notation for individual sections and if you have the the tapered section bar in a uniform uh, cross axial way then probably you are going to use the integration sign. So, you know like all those discussions were made on that if you see we have a bar irrespective of the prismatic or non prismatic bar and it is under the effect of twisting moment or the torque then you see you know like the t by j equals to tau by r equals to g theta by l. So, that we are using and if we want to calculate the maximum shear for either the solid shaft or circular shaft then you see tau maximum we calculated at 16 times uh, this uh, uh, torque which is applied divided by uh, this uh, d, d cube. So, you see you know like the shear stress is maximum with the torque applied as usually see if uh, more torque uh, more torque is there more shear stresses are there and the second you see it is a reciprocal relation with the diameter. So, this tau maximum is inversely propo is proportional to 1 by d cube. So, you see you know like we set up those relations and we found that actually how these shear stresses are you know like distributing if we have a this uh, solid circular bar or this hollow shaft. So, this kind of discussion we made in the previous lecture. Now, you see you know like we would like to continue this concept and we would like to apply this concept on the spring cons is, is spring uh, uh, as an element. So, now you see here if we have a closed coil helical spring means there are various forms of spring which we are going to discuss in our lecture. So, first of all you see if you are talking just a general spring which is a closed coil you see because you see the, all the coils are closed together means closed right from beginning to end and it, if it is subjected to an axial load then what will happen. So, you see first we would like to define a spring that a spring may be defined as an elastic member whose primary function is to deflect or distort under the action of applied load and it recovers its original shape when load is released. That means you see you know like whatever the spring is there the thin spring, thick spring or whatever the diameter is there always we assume that whatever the deformation is there under the application of any load on the spring it is just the elastic deformation. So, once you release the load the spring comes to its original shape there is no permanent set of deformation will be there within the spring format. So, this is the basic def definition of a spring and the basic function of the spring is just as the spring are always energy absorbing units whose function is to store the energy. So, you see when you apply the this uh, any load is there. So, it is simply stressed. So, whatever the energies are there it is simply converting into the kinetic one. So, once you rest once you release the load again it will simply squeeze into original form. So, whatever the energy is there it is simply converted into the potential one. So, you see it is simply absorbing the energy when you apply the load. 
So, you know like it is a kind of storage, it, it always spring is a device in which you can store the energy. So, to restore it slowly or we can say rapidly depending on the particular application. So, what kind of applications are there accordingly the spring acts. So, the meaning is pretty simple that actually spring is always acting in an elastic deformation and the basic purpose of the spring is to restore the energy. So, you see here if we want to use the energy in any of the function based on what application is there, the spring is acting correspondingly. So, now you see you know like uh, as I told you that we would like to define that what types of spring are. So, there are you see various types of springs such as first uh, we are saying as usual that helical springs are there that means the helical grooves are there in form of the coils of the spring. So, they are made of the wire coiled into a helical form. So, you see helix angles are there at a particular thing you see just if you cut the section from the center sign then you will find that there is a helix angle at a particular you know like uh, these axis form and the load being applied along the axis of a helix. So, you see whatever the load application is there, it is always just you know like applied along the particular axis of the helix. So, that you see whatever the elongation or the compression is there, it is along with that particular axis of the helix only. So, in these type of springs, the major stresses is the torsional stresses due to the twisting. Because you see whatever the kind of you know like uh, the moment or we can say the couple is there or any kind of twisting is there due to that, the first stresses which are forming in these kind of springs are only the, shear, uh, the shearing stresses or we can say the torsional shear stresses are there and they are both you see you know like uh, used in either in the tension side or in a compression side because you see you know like they are formed along with the helix part just you see along if you go with this uh, uh, this uh, uh, axis. So, whatever the compression you see compression is there or whatever the extensions are there always due to these kind of actions the kind of stresses which are occurring in these coils you see you can see these spring format the kind of stresses are there in these you know like the elements of the spring always uh, it is a torsional shear stresses and then you see you know like it all that uh, what the sustain, sustainability, sustainability is there of this kind of spring simply based on how these joints are functioning. So, you see when you are stretching these you know like joints are simply coming together you they are simply closing together towards the helix angle they are moving and then you see they are simply restoring the energy in this form or uh, vice versa is there when you are compression then you see it is simply you know like uh, consisting the energy and they are just going uh, apart from you know like uh, these uh, uh, this uh, angle of the uh, this axis of the helix. So, this is you see the basic form of a spring which is known as the helical spring and the second form of the spring is the spiral spring. As per its name you see it has a spiral coils in form of you know like the spring and again you see it is functioning exactly as the normal spring is. So, they are made of a you know like the flat strip of a metal wounded in form of the spiral and you know like it is loaded in the torsion only. So, in this you see the major stresses are tensile and compression due to the bending. So, you see if you see this particular figure you will find that what we have we have a simple you know like the strip of metal which is wounded in form of the spiral one. So, that is why you see it is known as the spiral spring. So, you see whenever a torque is applied you know like the kind of uh, squeezing is going on if we are turning in a, in a clockwise direction or if we are turning in an anti clockwise direction you know like uh, these are just coming out uh, outwards. So, you see irrespective of whether it is in the tensile form or it is in the compressive form, but always the bending action is happening on this kind of springs. So, you see if we have a pin or means if you apply the load you see it will simply you know like uh, the load is tra transfer from this way and it is always you see transferring like these these things. So, you see it will just try to expand. So, you see we have a tensile form or you see if you simply stretch this kind of thing here if you stretch in this way. So, you see uh, these kind of uh, load transfer is there along this particular line and all those you see these segments they are simply affected by this kind of load application and they are trying to squeeze so the compression is there. Meaning is pretty simple that it is always being loaded by a torsion, but the bending action is forming uh, and due to the bending you see we have either the tension or the compression forms of the stresses. So, you see he, here we have you see you know like all the kind of springs, but they are under the action of the torsional way only. 
and then you see if you go for the next spring which is a very common you know like application in all kinds of vehicle is the leaf spring so you see if you see any kind of vehicle you will find that we have a leaf springs just on the bottom of the these vehicles and they are you know perfect absorber of the energy so whatever the shocks are coming because you see you know like uh, they are simply absorbing the energy so whatever the shocks are or the impulse are coming from the road or the jerks are coming from the road towards the uh, you know vertical direction on the vehicle they are simply absorbing those shocks and whatever you see the material or even the human beings are sitting they are feeling more comfortable because of the shock absorber so we can say that these leaf springs are a perfect shock absorber as far as the vehicle is concerned vehicle design is concerned so they are composed of if you are talking about the leaf spring then they are composed of a flat bars so you can see here what we have we have a bars here so they are you know like the flat bars are there and we are simply you know like uh, composing those things only the main key feature is that they are having a varying length so you see at, at the bottom you will find that the you know like this bar is of the maximum length then we are simply reducing the length 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 and you see they are simply just attached on each other so that whatever the jugs are coming they are simply compression in this proper way so <clears throat> the meaning is pretty simple that leaf, leaf springs are always the composed of the flat bars of varying lengths as shown in this diagram clamped together so as to obtain a greater efficiency so you see you know, like if the compact design is there whatever the jerks are coming they can simply distribute it all amongst these uh, uh, varying length cross sectional you know like the composite bar and it can be easily absorbed those kind of socks Leaf, leaf spring may also you know like a fully elliptical semi elliptical or cantilever type so you see we have three basic types of the leaf, leaf springs are there based on what kind of applications are there corresponding you know like the leaf springs are usable so generally you see we are using the fully elliptical for you know like the bigger uh, this uh, vehicles but if we have you know like the small vehicles then probably you can use the semi elliptical sometimes or you see for different application the cantilever types of uh, leaf springs are also be usable in these type of springs the major stresses which comes into the picture are the tensile and compressive so you see as usual as you have seen in the previous uh, helical springs or the uh, you know like the spiral springs again in this kind of springs also in the leaf springs uh, we saw that uh, the major contribution uh, of the stresses are be due to the tensile and the compressive and these type of springs are used in the automobile suspension system so they have perfectly good for automobile this uh, auto, automobile uh, industries or we can say the vehicle system where we can simply put these leaf springs to get the perfect absorber so you can see in this particular di uh, diagram we have you know like the varying length of the cross sectional bar and whatever the load applications are there it is simply you know like distributed amongst that so whatever the stresses are being formed we can say that actually we can perfectly design the safe spring based on what the number of coils of springs are there means how many number of you know like the bars are there and how these you know like the compactly designed respective to which each other like this to this this to this and this to this so this is you see you know, like the third form of springs so now you see we discussed about the three basic forms and all three basic form in respect of if you are talking about you know like the helical spring or if you are talking about uh, this leaf spring or if you are talking about the spiral spring they have its own application though you see the stress formation on these kind of stresses they are very common but the applications are different so you see you know like if you are uh, if you are simply watching that you know like the axial loads are predominating so definitely you see we are go going for the helical spring so that whatever the stress formations are there we can clearly design those springs and we can see that actually how these stresses are being formed and what kind of deformations are there but if you are if we are talking about the impact or the jerks or this kind of impulsive forces then probably we are going for the this uh, helical springs uh, this uh, leaf springs as we discussed in the previous section so now you see we would like to see that what exactly the uses of the springs are so first you see to apply the force uh, to apply the forces or to control the motion as in brakes and clutch so you see if in any of the auto automobile the two main you know like the devices are there through which you see you know like uh, either we can apply the kind of this uh, uh, braking forces or we can say to just uh, shifting the power transmission either the brakes or the clutches they are absolutely based on these springs so you will find that if you want to transfer you know like the power from one gear to another it is simply you know like uh, the spring device is there which simply you know like freeze 
we simply you know like uh, gives you the free kind of motion in between these uh, uh, parallel shaft of the gear or we can say whenever we are talking about the brake when you push the brake you see these springs are there which control the motion of uh, your foot so that uh, it is not that actually when you apply the brake immediately it simply goes in impulsive way and suddenly it stops no it is going in a very smooth way because when you apply your force it simply gain the energy and this energy is simply releasing uh, just uh, releasing in, in form of the transformation so this is the basic use of these springs that actually they simply apply the force or we can say rather they are simply transmitting the force and they also control the motion in form of either the brakes or we can say in form of the clutches second uh, use is to measure forces as in the spring balance so you see this is the perfect use wherever we are you know like balancing those things always if you see any kind of you know like the balancing machine it is simply based on the spring or if you want to even the measure of the force always spring is there because f equals to kx and always you see that actually what the stiffness of the spring is there and how you see you know like uh, uh, these uh, deformation is going on under the application of this force once you know the deformation once you know the stiffness you can find out the force or you can say you see whatever the weight measuring machines are there always they are simply based on the spring balance so if you want to measure the force or if you want to measure the weight of any uh, person or we can say any object then these you know like uh, whatever the machines are there they are absolutely based on these springs or we can say if you want to measure the force a spring balance is a basic concept to measure those kind of forces so this is the second use of the spring third is to uh, store the energy as in clock spring so you see here you know in nowadays you see all these clocks are basically based on the batteries but if you go for any older clock simply you see the coiled spring the spiral spring was there those you know like the flat foils are there and they are simply wounded in the coil form and we are keeping those things so once you squeeze that you know like by the key they store the energy and you see corresponding the release of energy there according to the minute or we can say the hour or in particular you know like these uh, 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 the simultaneous relation is there in between the hour and the minute uh, <clears throat> those uh uh, clock wires so meaning is pretty simple that if we have the dial of this clock and if we have you know like the two indicators for irrespective of whether the minute or hour simply they are getting the energy from those springs only and you know like the there is a perfect use of this uh, uh, application of or we can say the these springs are there that actually they are simply restoring the energy and they are releasing as per their use and the fourth use is to reduce you know like the effect of the shock or impact loading as in the carries spring so you see you know like the perfect use as we you know like discussed in the previous section that if we have you know like the leaf springs then whatever the shocks are coming or whatever the impacts are coming from any of the input excitation not from these roads but from any of the input excitation it can be simply absorbed that shocks and you know like whatever the load trans uh, transmission is there to the upper section is very smooth it is linearly varying so that's why you see we are using in all those vehicles in the automobile particular these kind of leaf springs to uh, absorb the shocks or impact and the last use is the main use is here to change the vibration characteristic of a member in uh, as in flexible uh, this mounting of a motors that's a perfect use in main uh, uh, this industry particular that if you want you know like there are various vibration characteristics are there and if you know the basics of vibration then you see i just want to refresh those vibration concept that whenever we are talking about the vibration the main phenomena when is coming that actually you know like that how the displacements are there the displacement means actually how this you know like they are varying from their own position so if you are talking about the vibration any single degree of freedom or two degree of freedom then the main equation is coming that mass into acceleration plus stiffness into displacement plus damping into velocity is equals to whatever the external excitation is there so here you see if you are talking about the spring then how much deformation is there in any of the particular section like k k into x uh, k into x is there so whatever you see you know like the stiffer part is there and how the displacement is coming in that part they are simply measuring so you see if you want to change the vibration characteristics always we are putting the springs as an uh, absorber part so that you see you know, like whatever the vibrations are coming it can be easily absorbed or we can say we can simply restore the energy so we can simply change the vibration characteristic of a member as an inflexible mounting of a particular motors in terms of the electrical motors or we can say you know like the induction motors are there through which the power generation is so these are the basic uses that's why you see the study of the springs are very very important now you see we would like to derive the formula for a spring 
In order to derive the necessary formula again, we would like to first see that what the exact mechanism is there of a spring and if under the load application, how they are deformed. So you see here we are you know like if you see this particular figure they will find that we have a spring which is simply you know like hanged on a particular uh, this wall. So this is my datum on which this uh, spring is hanged and if you apply the load in towards the lower direction this W then there is a kind of expansion is there. So now you see you know like we would like to see the behavior of a spring just considering a closed coil spring which is you know like subjected under the radial load W. So as I told you you know like whatever the deformation or the extension is there it is just along the axis of the helix. So, you see here we have the diameter and whatever the you know twisting form is coming it will, it, it will form or the shear stresses are coming they are coming in form of these coils. So, you see we would like to see that what will happen exactly. So, we have you know like uh, first of all we would like to define the terminology basic terminology or you see basic uh, parameters of this particular spring. So, we have used like this uh, capital D is there, small d is there, W is there. So, we would like to first define those things. So, here it is you see as I told you W is nothing but the axial load which is in terms of the Newton always which because we are applying at the extreme corner the bottom corner of the spring. So, how much you see you know like uh, this radial load is there in terms of Newton and due to that actually how much deformation is there in that particular spring that is the matter of concern. Second as I you know like show you on the bottom that we have a capital D, capital D is nothing but the mean coil diameter from one junction to another junction. So, you see you know like we are simply putting the cross section and we are measuring that what exactly the capital D is because you see whatever the twisting is coming it will come along this particular D or we can say the mean, di mean coil diameter. Then we found that we have the small d is there in those particular junctions. So, that a small d is nothing but the diameter of the spring wire because you see all those helix are coming with those uh, junctions of the spring wire. So, we would like uh, our interest because uh, our interest is there to see that what the diameter is because you know like the shear stresses are coming all along with this small diameter. Then you see we have the n which is the number of active coils that how many coils are there means actually how many you know like these two junctions are there. So, our main interest is the number of how many number of coils are there. So, if we want to design any spring the n is also an imp uh, it, it is also taking an important uh, this uh, playing an important role to design those things. Then we have one constant that is the spring index which is nothing but equals to d by d for a circular wire. So, if we have a circular wire, wire then we can simply calculate the spring index which is nothing but equals to mean coil diameter divided by the uh, this diameter of the spring wire. And then you see we have you know like if you stress those you know like the all those wires you have the total length of the spring wire which is nothing but the small l. And since you see whatever the deformation is there of the spring under the action of this w whatever you see you know like the shear stresses are coming or shear strain is there we are as I told you, you know like uh, we are only interested to go up to the uh, this uh, elastic deformation or we can say the generalized Hooke's, uh, Hooke's law is there. So, for that we have the uh, this uh, shear modulus of rigidity is there. So, as usually you see we are showing by g and then x you see because of the load application there is a deflection. So, what how much deflection is there we are measuring with the x. So, x is the deflection of a spring and theta is the angle of twist that actually how the twisting is there if the shear stresses are acting on that particular way. So, now you see by defining all those terms now when the spring is being subjected to an axial load as I showed you in the previous diagram the wire of the spring you know it gets to be twisted like a shaft. So, as you can see this particular diagram you will find that whatever the wires of the springs are there which has a diameter of you know like the small d of in, in between and the total capital D diameter is there. So, it is simply twisted exactly like the shaft. So, you can see in this particular diagram the, we have a twisted shaft and the twi angle of twist which we are measuring is the theta and you see whatever the deflection is coming in that spring is simply x. So, this is the load application and this is the deflection is there. And if you want to measure the deflection what we have we have the angle of twist. So, you see if I am saying that this particular diameter because the total diameter is d which is the you know like the mean diameter is there of the coil. So, probably we can take this d by 2 here. So, now you see if the theta is the total angle of twist along with the wire and x is the deflection of the spring under the you know like action of this uh, radial load w along the axis of the coil. So, we can say that whatever the x is coming this uh, by simply you know like uh, uh, this radius uh, the radius equals to arc divided by you know like that how much deflection is there. So, by that formula we can simply calculate that x is nothing but equals to this total d by 2 into theta. So, this d by 2 into theta will give you the total deflection or we can say that if you are simply stretching that uh, you know like uh, this uh, spring up to the total length and total length is nothing but equals to how many number of coils are there in 
into you know like the p into d uh, after considering those things you see you know like for one half turn of the uh, closed coil spring we can say that the theta which is the angular deflection is nothing but equals to 2x by d so you see here just remember this formula that whenever you know like under the uh, this uh, action of rad this uh, <coughs> radial load towards the downward direction if any angle twist is there and the deflection x is there then the angle of twist of that particular spring part is nothing but equals to 2 times of the deflection divided by the mean coil diameter so we're going to use this particular formula in the next slide so now you see before starting the analysis we would like to put certain assumptions here so the first assumption is that we are simply neglecting the bearing this bending and the shear effect in that because right now you see our main concern that whenever the load application is there due to that load application how the tension and the compression is taking place in that and you see due to that how shear shearing parts are coming along the helical part so you see our main concentration is just in the shear stresses of those kind of springs so you see we are simply neglecting the bending as well as the shearing effect in those things though you see they are acting here but to make it make our uh, you know like easy analysis we are ignoring that part second is assumption is for the purpose of the derivation of the formula the helix angle alpha generally we are using the helix angle alpha is considered to be so small that it can be neglected because you see since you know like the shear shear shearing part is coming along the axis of helix so definitely there is a deviation is there in the helix angle so we'd like to measure that part but it is so small that as compared to the other uh, this angle of twist so we can simply neglect that part so you see any one coil of such a spring will be assumed to lie in a plane which is nearly perpendicular to the axis of a spring and you see this requires something like the adjoining uh, this adjoining coils of a uh, just whatever the adjoining coils are there this simply requires to coming these coils to get uh, close together so we would like to see that actually what exactly the impacts are impact is there under the action of uh, these uh, uh, radial load and how these shearing uh, shearing uh, stresses are being formed in that kind of uh, closed coil so we have seen the limitation so within this limitation x axis has to be taken perpendicular to the axis of the spring rod which becomes nearly vertical so what has happened you see we just want to maintain the equilibrium of a segment of the spring because if they are coming to close together you see always you see we just try to maintain that actually it should be there under whatever the shearing action are there shearing action is there it has to be there within the equilibrium position of that particular segment of the spring so only a shearing force v equals to f we can say v is the shear force so whatever the force is applying we are taking as a shearing force v and the torque which is coming due to this shearing force is f into r are just required at the x axis you see we simply cut the x axis so once you know like you did it that uh, the shearing action we can say that uh, whatever the complementary shearing stresses are coming they can simply maintain the equilibrium of that particular segment of the spring so in the analysis of the spring it is customary to assume that the shearing stresses caused by the direct shear force is uniformly distributed and it is negligible because you see if it is not uh, uniformly distributed then we have a you know like a stress concentration for that and due to the stress concentration always there is a uniform shear deformations are there or distortions are there and we, if we want to measure the shear strain probably you see this is the weaker section is there where these cracks or the spells are there or it, if it is not uniformly distributed so you see we need to be very careful that actually whether the shearing uh, stresses which are inducing due to the case of this kind of forces it has to be it has to be uniformly distributed so you see once we know that actually the shearing stresses are there and under the, under the action of this torque uh, we know that the standard equation is nothing but equals to t by z which is equals to tau by r is equals to g theta by l so now we would like to substitute whatever the different components of the you know like these uh, uh, these uh, this particular equations are and if you want to compute those things for a spring element then we can simply compute as the z which is the section modulus of you know like uh, this uh, uh, inertia is equals to pi d4 by 32 where the d is you know like uh, the spring wire diameter is there because the shearing is coming all across the axis of the helix so this diameter is the effective under the action of this torque so this is you see the g is there uh, the j is there pi d4 by 32 and the torque which is coming is nothing but equals to when you apply the load and it is just at the d by 2 so 
W into D by 2 will give you the torque and as I told you see under the action of these uh, you know like the load we have the deflection and the deflection is coming at the angle of this uh, twisting angle theta so we made already the uh, this relation that x is equals to d by 2 into theta or we can say the angle of twist theta is nothing but equals to 2 x by d so it will be you know like uh, this theta is equals to 2 x by t and l which is you see you know like the total length is there which is pi into d into x is there pi d is the total you know like the the area into you know like once you multiply with this uh, you know like the x then probably you will be ending at uh, the total length of these things so by keeping those we can simply calculate that what the spring deflection is so now you see just uh, we are keeping those values there in the first equation and we would like we, we found that uh, wd by 2 which is you see you know like the torque divided by the z this is pi d 4 by 32 is equals to z into theta which is you see you know, like we already calculated the 2x divided by d divided by pi d into n that is the l. So g theta by l is this value and t by z is this value. So from that we can simply calculate that how much the spring deflection is. So this x value will be equals to you know like when we calculate these 2 by 2 will cut out. So this you see 4 so we have the 8, 8 into w into you see the capital D cube which is you see now like uh, these forms will come into you know like uh, the D into the number of coils divided by Z into D4. So what we have if you see this deflection formula it is absolutely depends on that how much load we are applying. So it is directly proportional to the load applied and then it is the nonlinear term you know like nonlinear variation is there with the diameter mean diameter of that. So X is proportional to W X is proportional to D cube and X is also linearly proportional to the number of coils. So if you have more number of coils then probably you see we have you know like the extension is pretty more but it has a in it just uh, inversely proportional to small d. So if we have more thicker wire probably you know it will provide more stiffer stiffness and we have the less deflection is there. So that is what you see x is proportional to 1 over d4 and you see g is the shear modulus of rigidity which is the material property. So the corresponding deflection is there. If we are you know like having more uh, this rigid material or we can say the stiffer material we have definitely the less deflection is. So they have the res uh, this reciprocal relations are. So you see here if you want to calculate the spring uh, deflection and this if this spring is under the application of the radial load and due to this radial load if we have you know like the shearing action and due to this shearing action if we have this angle of twist theta is there. So we can calculate the deflection x is equals to 8 times radial load w into capital D which is the mean diameter is cubic into number of coils and divided by G into D4 where D is the spring wire diameter. So now you see once you have the deflection then probably you can calculate the stif 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 spring stiffness because the spring stiffness is nothing but equals to load per unit deflection. So you see you know like uh, we are applying the W load and we have the X deflection. So we can calculate the stiffness K is nothing but equals to W by X where W is W is the radial load divided by you can put this particular X which is nothing but equals to 8 W D cube and divided by G D4. Therefore, what we have? We have the spring stiffness K is equals to G D to the small D to the power 4 that is nothing but the spring wire diameter to the power 4 divided by 8 D cube N. Please remember this formula because it is very very important formula for any kind of numerical problems because you see when we are solving you know like uh, the deflection or the stiffness you know like uh, or when we are designing the spring these formulas are very very important that under if you apply let us say 10 uh, kilo newton load or any kind of load you see then how much deflection is there and what is the total stiffness is coming after this load. So these two formulas are important once the deflection which is nothing but equals to 8 W capital D cube into n divided by GD4 or we can say the K which is the spring stiffness which is nothing but equals to G into small d to the power 4 divided by 8 to capital D cube into N where N is the number of coils of the spring. So you see these two formula after that you see you know like once you have the deflection once you have the spring stiffness then you can easily calculate with the using of the main uh, this torsional for, uh, equation that what is the shearing stresses are there. So you know like uh, we would like to calculate the shearing stresses and shearing stresses are always you know like uh, maximum when this uh, radius is exactly uh, at the circumference. So when we have the d by 2 as a distance then we have the maximum shearing stresses. So again you see we would like to put this particular formula where t by z equals to tau by r where r is nothing but equals to d by 2 small d by 2. So you see here 
after keeping that formula w into d by 2 divided by that is the t divided by z that is pi d 4 divided by 32 equals to tau maximum divided by d by 2. So, after you see manipulating what we have, we have the shear stress maximum is equals to 8 times w in uh, w the radial load into the mean diameter divided by pi d cube. So, you see the shearing stresses are directly proportional to the what the diameter is there more diameter more shearing stresses are there because more of a twisting is there. But you see if we have the spring diameter is more than we have you know like the less shearing stresses because the shearing is there along the axis of the helix. So, if more diameter is there it provides more resistances. So, you see we have you know like uh, the, uh, the whatever the stress formations are there they are quite less as compared to the mean diameter. So, this is you see you know, like the spring uh, you know like uh, the three main characteristics are there. One we calculated that what the deflections are there under the uh, load of under the axial load we have the stiffness the spring stiffness under the ap application of the load and we have the shear stresses under the application of the radial load. So, these three formulas are th these three formulas are really uh, you know important for any kind of calculation or if you want to design those things you would be very careful to choose the, uh, the appropriate value just for you know like a safe design of the spring. Then in that you see there is a wall factor is there and wall factor is nothing but you see if you want to you know like uh, Consider the effect of direct stress and we just want to see the change in coil curvature. Uh, uh, stress factor is coming and this stress factor is you know like known as the Walsh factor. So, you see here the main thing is that actually we are going to consider the effect of uh, straight direct stresses along the axis of helix. So, what will happen you see if you are considering that uh, you know like the direct stress then straight way there is a change in the coil curvature because you see right now we are taking you know like the straight part but when there is a shearing part is there a kind of curvature uh, form is there in this particular spring wire. So, now you see if you want to compute that part always you see there is a factor that factor as it, it is known as the wall factor which can be easily computed on the basis of 4C and C you see we have already you know like uh, define that it is the spring index which is nothing but equals to the ratio of capital D by small d that means it is the ratio of two diameters the mean diameter of the spring divided by the spring wire diameter. So, you see here once you know the value of C it is c is nothing but the dimensional parameter so 4 times of c minus 1 divided by 4 divided by 4 times of c minus 4 plus 0.615 divided by c so you see based on those diametrical values that how the curvature will take place and if you want to avoid the curvature we have to design or we can say we need to take the value of k in appropriately so that this curvature uh, coil curvature will not be formed and the straight uh, you know like uh, uh, this straight straight formation of the uh, this uh a spring wire will be coming into the picture under the action of this radial load. So, now you see here as I told you the C is the spring index d by d and if we take into account the Walsh factor in that formula only what we have we have the shear stresses as 16 times of t into k divided by pi d cube. So, you see here now straight way the shear stresses are the proportional to the applied torque and proportional to this uh, the, uh, this wall factor. So, you see whatever the wall factors are there according if we have more curvature part probably you see we have more shearing part the shearing stresses are there all along the stre this uh, all along the section. So, you see when we want to design any spring and if we have these kind of wall factors and the shear stresses are there then we can set up the relation based on these things. So, you see the tau maximum that is the shear stresses are nothing but equals to 16 times of t into k divided by pi d cube. Now, you see you have the shear stress, you have all those parameters and you see we are assuming that whatever the deformation is coming under the action of this radial load is the, uh, the elastic deformation. So, you see we can simply and the basic purpose of uh, this spring is to store the energy. So, whatever the storing energy is there, this is known as the strain energy. So, you see the strain energy we can simply define as the energy which is stored within the material or the spring material I should say when the work has been done on the material. So, in you know like since we are using the spring, so the strain energy would be due to the bending and the strain energy due to bending is given here in this equation that U which is this, uh, this strain energy is equals to you know like it is coming due to the applied torque. So, T square L divided by 2 times E i and again you see here please keep this thing in mind that if we apply the load whatever the deformation is coming it is only the elastic deformation and this strain energy is defined for that reason only. So, the strain energy is the function of T square that is the, uh, the applied torque into the length of that particular spring divided by 2 e i and you see you know like uh, since if you are saying that the unstressed length of the L 
and stretch length of the spring is the L which is nothing but equals to pi D which is the area into the number of coils. So, N is there or we can say the small L is nothing but equals to the, uh, the spring wire uh, you know like uh, this uh, length. So, we have pi D 4 divided by 64. So, you see after keeping those values we have the strain energy is equals to 32 times T square D into N divided by E D 4. So, you see here again what we are define what we are trying to define here the strain energy is nothing but the function of that what the torque is there due to which this bending action is forming and then what the mean diameter is there. So, it is directly proportional to that and how many number of coils is there because more number of coils more you know like the strain uh, we can say absorbing capacity or strain this energy saving capacity. So, when we are saying that uh, we can simply you know like store the more and more energy if more number of coils are there then the spring is very good or we can say it, it can easily compensate whatever the socks are coming. So, whatever the socks we can say that actually the socks are coming we are simply designing based on the capital D divided by the small d that means the spring wire diameter. So, now we would like to you know like whatever the formula which we derived here we would like to put those formula in the real example. So, we have an example as if we have a, a closed coil closed coil helical spring and is simply carrying a load of 5000 Newton or we can say 5 kilo Newton with a deflection of 50 millimeter and the maximum shearing stress under that particular 5 kilo Newton load is 400 Newton per millimeter square and if the active turns of or we can say the total number of coils are 8 then we would like to find out that what is the spring wire diameter the small d the mean coil diameter capital D the weight of the spring and you see with that we are assuming that the shear modulus of uh, rigidity the z is nothing but equals to 83000 newton per meter square Gen generally it is always given in terms of uh, the kilo newton or the mega newton particular but it is in this way and we have the radius r uh, this uh, uh, this r is nothing but equals to 7700 kilogram per meter cube so you see with the consideration of all those parameters we would like to find it out these three parameters. So, here it is you see if you want to calculate the wire diameter again we are going with the same equation T by Z equals to uh, this uh, tau, uh, tau by R. So, by keeping those values T W D by 2 pi divided by pi D 4 divided by 32 equals to tau maximum divided by D by 2. After keeping those values we can simply calculate the capital D which is our main concern. So, capital D is equals to 400 which we are applying here divided by d by uh, 2 into pi d 4 divided by 32 into 2 by w or we can say this d this outer uh, because you see we want to calculate both the diameter. So, the outer the mean diameter capital D is nothing but equals to after keeping those values what we have we have 0 0.01 uh, 0314 d cube. Or you see you know like after we just want to keep those things so that once we have the one more equation we can simply generalize those things or we can say once we know the value of either this d or this d we can simply find out the vice versa part. So, here you see the same thing if you know the deflection formula you can simply keep that formula and x is nothing but equals to 8 w d cube n divided by z d 4. So, now you see you know the maximum value the applied load you know you know like and you know the how many number of coils are there you know the z value you know that you know like these kind of values. So, we can simply put that how much deflection is there. So, deflection was 50 millimeter and the value of w was there and all those per particular parameters are there. So, we can simply calculate that actually what is the value of the small d. So, a small d is nothing but equals to it comes around 13.32 millimeter. So, once you know the small d keep that value and get the value of capital D. So, you see we have the spring wire diameter you have the mean diameter of that. So, you see capital D is coming as 74.15 millimeter and if you want to calculate the weight of that weight is nothing but equals to you know like the mass or we can say the weight is volume into density or density is nothing but equals to mass per unit volume. So, now you see you know the volume, volume is nothing but the area into length of the spring uh, length this uh, spring which is pi d n into you see the density of the spring material which is already given as a 7700. So, you see by keeping all those values we can simply find out the weight which is nothing but equals to 1.996 kilogram or we can say the spring weight is 2 kilogram. So, the meaning is pretty simple if you know these uh, you know like the different values and and if you know the formula you can simply put those values in the formula and you can get the desired output. So, but the key feature is that whatever the 
formula which we derived it is simply you know like valid just for the elastic deformation so here you see now uh, we, are, we would like to see the another case that if we have the closed coil helical spring which is subjected to the axial torque or we can say the axial couple instead of just you know like giving the radial load we have the axial couple which is just try to twist that part so now the effective area is like that you see this is simply uh, put in the curved form and what we have we have you see you know like the shearing action is there all along this particular action so under the action of this t we would like to see that actually how they are you know like uh, significantly affect the axial couple so you see in this case the material of the spring is subjected to the pure bending which tends to reduce the radius r of the coil so you see it is just uh, tending to cur uh, come in the curvature part and in this case the bending moment is simply constant throughout the spring and you see we would like to even put this this particular assumption here which is equal to the applied torque you know like what the applied torque is there and due to this actually how this bending will take place so if we want to see the stress which is nothing but the bending maximum bending stress is always coming as the main bending formula the bending moment because whenever the bending action is there the bending moment into the uh, total y whatever the you know like the distance is there from the neutral axis divided by the uh, i or i is nothing but equals to pi d4 by 64 that is the inertial factor so you see we have the moment t into d y is nothing but the dy2 divided by pi d4 by 60 uh, the 64 we can calculate the maximum shearing bending stresses is equals to 32 d by pi d cube so always keep this thing in your mind so whenever the spring element is there and if it is under the action of this twisting torque the maximum bending stresses are forming in this spring coil and this is equals to 32 by pi d cube so you see here like uh, this was the basic application that if we have a radial load or if we have the twisting moment then what the changes are there in form of the stresses now you see our last part of this chapter is if the deflection is there or wind up angle is there then how you know like uh, they are simply forming under the action of these forces so under the action of any axial torque the deflection of spring becomes wind up angle or we can say you know like it is just uh, they are just trying to close to uh, just uh, trying to close close as 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 much as it can and you see it just it, it is forming that actually it is just winding up so we are saying that it is a wind up angle as generally we are saying that it is angle of twist but here it is nothing but the wind up angle of the spring which is the angle throughout you know like uh, one end turns related to the another that means uh, one end is coming close to another end and this will be equal to the total change of slope along the wire according to the area moment diagram so you see if you want to calculate that then it, it is nothing but equals to theta is equals to 0 to l m the total uh, moment applied or we can say the torque applied into the dl that effective you know like uh, these uh, uh, this uh, whatever the segment of this particular length of this spring into e into i or we can say you know like the applied torque is there so t into dl into ei t and ei are nothing but the constant parameter so we can simply find it out the total length l so the total theta or we can say the wind up angle is nothing but equals to tl by ei or since l you know that it is the unstressed length of the spring so it is pi d n or i we know that you know like uh, the section uh, modulus is there so it is pi d4 divided by or we can say the moment of inertia i is there pi d4 by 64 so we can calculate the uh, wind up angle for this kind of spring is nothing but equals to 64 d d into n divided by e d4 so you see here we see that how these springs you know like uh, uh, these are taking place whenever you see you know like uh, uh, under the action of any twisting moment or under under the action of the radial load like that and as usually see if these springs are in the series form that means you see you know like if these springs are well connected to the series we can simply form those that what the stiffness is there the stiffness is 1 by k equals to 1 by k1 plus 1 by k2 and if these springs are in the parallel form and the radial load is acting then stiffness is nothing but equals to the linear relations k1 plus k2 so in this chapter you see we discussed all those terms which is related to the spring that you see if the axial load is there or twisting moment is there then what the angle of twist is there or wind up angle is there or if the springs are there in the series form or the parallel form then how the stiffness is taking taken care of if it is in the shear then it is k is nothing but equals to k1 k2 divided by k1 plus k2 if the springs are there in the parallel form then k is nothing but equals to k1 plus k2 so in the next lecture you see we are going to see that if we have a uniform bar and if it is under uh, you know like uh, under the various loads then how the bending will form if it is a point load is there or if it is a uniform distributed loads are there so now our focus is on the especially beam or we can say the rod thank you
Thank you.